Hello, welcome back to China Manufacturing Decoded, the podcast from Sofeast. This is episode 144, and it's Adrian here from the team, and I'm with Renault, our CEO again. Hi, Renault. Hey, Adrian. How are you doing? An interesting topic today. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good one. It's a good one. How are you doing as well? Yeah, great, great. Um, traveling around USA and Canada to uh, basically say hi to clients that uh, haven't come, <laughs> usually haven't come for, for three years. Mm. Right? So uh, yeah, it's uh, I planned for this trip for already, uh, I don't know, more than three months ago. Actually, yeah. before China said that they, uh, they would reopen. Uh, but mm. it's a good time to come anyway. It's a good time. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so you started off at CES in Las Vegas. There was a episode that mm. uh, you recorded about that a couple of episodes right. ago. And so you're making your way around North America at the moment. And so to get on to today's topic, then. Today, we're going to focus on a couple of articles from the FT about Apple and how they built their supply chain in China and also how easy or difficult it might be for them to disentangle themselves from China, as if they're sort of too reliant on China in some ways. So what stood out about these articles for you, Renaud? Well, it's a lot of articles about, you know, Apple, and then usually they mention Foxconn, sometimes mm. maybe Pegatron or Luxshare, really stay at the surface. They don't really try to um, to understand exactly what the the Apple team in China has been doing what the what the Apple USA team has been you know how involved have they been and so on right and the, it's it's journalists very often you know they they don't really understand what 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 Apple has been doing and they they kind of focus on on some hero figures you know you have you have Cook and you have Ive and you have Jobs and what were they doing and blah 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 right and um, mm. and it, it you read these articles and really you don't learn much. So a lot of people are imagining a lot of things, you know, that Apple just like designs, like they think it's just, okay, this is what it's going to look like. And then they, 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 you know, they fax it or I don't know, they, 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 they email it to, to some people in, in, in Taiwan who will do some of the work and then they will just pop, you know, make it, you know, it, hmm. But there's so, so, so much more to the process, right? So um, uh, the, this uh, journalist, uh, Patrick McGee from the Financial Times, interviewed a number of um, uh, ex-Apple employees and some uh, what they call supply chain experts and manufacturing experts and so on. And they, they uh, yeah, they provide some, some, some good information about the way Apple has really... Um, developed their supply chain. They have really um, asserted control of, of, of what happens and how it's done and um, how, how much detail they go into really. Uh, when, when they're designing their new product, they're really also designing and developing and testing new production processes often. And that's really what people are missing, um, right? So a lot of People come to us and they say, well, yeah, this is an electronic product and it, it needs to be a little bit premium. So, you know, it's got to be like an Apple product. Uh. <laughs> and, 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 and we're laughing, but uh, people really don't understand, you know, uh, first, do you have a first class design studio, right? With people um, handpicked and trained by Johnny Hyde and so on, right? For the engineering uh sorry, the industrial design. Uh, second, do you have the depth of um, of, of, of um, engineering, you know, product engineering skills and, and talents to, to get to the same sort of user experience? And third, um, do you have Apple's knowledge of the supply chain and actually Apple's own supply chain? Because really, to a certain extent, people miss that, but um, they think Apple is just subcontracting, you know, just like in the 90s or the 
actually more like the, the 2000s, I think. A lot of people were, were saying, well, this is the new trend. Look at Nike. They're just a manufacturing company and mm. they don't do any of the manufacturing. They don't own the, 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 the manufacturing facilities. Um, so they just design the shoe and, and, and sell the shoe and that's it, right? Mm. Which was a bit of a, a shortcut also because Nike is involved and knows what's going on and, 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 and pushes these manufacturing facilities to get better and so on and so forth, right? But with, with Apple and, and, you know, the iPhones and the, the MacBooks and the iPads and so on, there's, there's so many components, so many uh, production processes, including some production processes that they, uh, you know, that only Apple actually um, get their suppliers to 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 apply. That, that, people don't don't realize that the thing is just like any other importer who designs something, sends it to to a factory in Shenzhen. Oh, hey, can you make that? Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, let us work on prototype. And the buyer is very hands off. Well, Apple is as far away from that as they can, mm. right? Um, even though that's true, they don't actually own the manufacturing facilities. Um, they go through a variety of contract manufacturers, but uh, they actually very much uh, design, develop, and own some of the manufacturing processes, and 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 that's what um, that's what these journalists went into, and it, it's it's quite important, right? Mm. Um, so, yeah, a couple of good articles actually. The first one is how Apple tied it, its fortunes to China, and then the second yeah. one is what it would take for Apple to dis disentangle itself from China, which is also uh, interesting. Um, it's I think we discussed a little bit about these articles um, before recording. Mm. They, they they tend to um, to focus a bit, actually a lot on the uh, the, the politi political aspect of it, the the U.S. versus China. Uh, growing, I don't know, uh, enmity. You know, uh, it's a, including a tech war, which is, you know, which is a bit of a problem, right? Mm. Um, and and all kinds of of things uh, that, that that people in the USA don't don't like to, um, to to think of when they hear China, right? So um, it 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 does focus a bit a bit too much on that, in my um, in my opinion. It kind of reads a lot of the the decisions of Apple under that lens. Like for example, for example, they so Apple was working um, nearly exclusively with Taiwanese-owned contract manufacturers, right? So yeah. Foxconn, Pegatron, Wistron, these kinds of companies. Um, and then um, at one point they started to to work with um with some chinese owned contract manufacturers right and i think the the, the most famous one is is luxshare they started to make some uh, some airpods and then from there they went on to to make some other uh, product ranges mm. um for for apple and then there's a couple of others that are cited here gore-tech and wink tech so uh, these are large chinese owned companies that um, also manage the supply chain. Uh, also um, have manufacturing, uh, you know, at, at the very least assembly facilities, and um, and do whatever Apple tells them to do, and put a lot of engineers to to, to work on it and so on, and and, and it works, right? Uh, more or less, right? We don't know the details, but at least for Luxshare, it works relatively well because they um, they're getting more and more. Uh, of of the manufacturing for Apple, and then the journalists say, "Well, um, you know, Apple was kind of forced by Beijing to to go with what they call red, uh, like the color red CMs, right? Because Chinese Chinese owned, um, and to to give less and less to the Taiwanese uh, contract manufacturers. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people, you know, uh, around." Run Shenzhen are kind of familiar with the, the the games of the Apple purchasing group, uh, and um, they, they they kind of have a cycle, you know, with with, with their suppliers, except for the the very key ones that that, that really do a, a great job 
in uh, putting a lot of resources together very fast and so on, it's like Foxconn. But for the others, they they tend to um, to press them like lemons. And, and and then introduce some some new competition to keep pressing them like lemons okay um, and i think that's that's mostly what has happened here you know oh there's there's this relatively large you know and capable chinese manufacturers you know um let's test them let's give them some work and then we are not stuck with the with the taiwanese companies right yeah. and that makes a lot of sense business wise uh, it's definitely part of the the reasoning um the, the companies like Luxshare, they raised a lot of money on the stock market. They have a lot of working capital and so on to, to put in there, just like the Taiwanese. So yeah. what's the big uh the big advantage of the Taiwanese now over these these Chinese owned companies? I'm not so sure, right? I'm not so sure at all. So a bit focusing a little bit too much on the political aspect of it, uh, but uh, apart from that, mm. they really go into uh, the details and, and we can go through that uh, as an overview so that yeah. people really understand what um what what the, the apple teams have been doing so yes. the very first thing and i was not aware of that i didn't know the number but there's close to 15,000 one five 15,000 people in china working directly for apple okay so mm-hmm. it's not just like a buying office <laughs> you know there's there's a bunch of um, a, a bunch of engineers there um, with varying uh, specialties who follow up on a number of things and who really go as deep as they can through the supply chain. And they are they are the big guy there, right? They are the ones who 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 make the decisions, and they are the ones who can push and who can say, okay, but where is this done and why? You know, I want to make sure this can scale. I want to make sure uh, we understand how this works. So where is this made? Okay, okay, we'll bring you to the sub-supplier. Okay, da, 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 da. same questions. Oh, okay, so this relies maybe on that, um, uh, uh, on, on the firmware that was developed by that company. Oh, okay, I need to go and meet with them, you know. So they go through um, all the important nodes of the, of the supply chain. And they really go deep, deep into the details. And for people who have read a little bit about Tim Cook, uh, this is really not surprising. This is a guy who um, who will grill, who, who is extremely good at um, getting deep, deep down into the details and confirming that you know any report that he's given, any um, any dashboard with numbers, whatever, that the people presenting it to him have really. Uh, doing all the work to fully, fully understand it, right? So he re- really grills the people down to to a level of detail that uh, that that's kind of shocking to, to to a lot of employees at the beginning. And mm-hmm. of course, this you know it's drilled down to all his supply chain group and all all of the people in in, in operations um, do the same, you know, with their subordinates, with their teams, and and with their suppliers, right? So I'm, I'm not surprised. So that's the first thing. Apple has a huge presence on the ground in China, doing a lot of the work of figuring out what's going on in the supply chain, planning in the details. Okay, we're going to develop this product. It's going to need this, 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 this. Are we sure that we know exactly how it's going to be uh, made, where, how? You know, what what are the, the challenges? What are the risks? How to do? And they really go through um, uh, very uh, extensive plans because they they really don't want bad surprises, right? right. Uh, if, if they make whatever, 200 million iPhones in a year, well, mm-hmm. imagine if, um, if one of the models suddenly cannot sell, has capacity or quality problems uh, because of one of the, tens and tens, actually hundreds of, of parts that go into it that maybe mm-hmm. cannot be made at the, at the right, um, in the right number or at the right quality. Well, that is a huge financial impact, right? So they really mm. spend all the time to understand all of that and plan ahead. And they are quite aware of the risks and they do a lot of things to, to manage it. Okay. Well, That's it's, the first it's, thing. It's, it's yeah. the commitment to quality, isn't it? Because if you want to be the best... 
that mm-hmm. level of being yeah. so hands on is yeah. maybe more necessary because actually you've created a video recently which is coming out soon on the Sophie's YouTube channel I'll leave the link in the show mm-hmm. notes about managing the MPI process depending on your manufacturer's abilities and in theory if you're working with a very experienced contract manufacturer such as a you know Pegatron who can do a lot of this work themselves and be relied upon you may not need to be so hands on but the fact that they've got 15,000 apple staff in china being hands on well that's why they're one of the most if not the most profitable business in the world well they have certainly have some of the 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 best um yeah the the, the best products in their category and look at yeah. the premium at which they are selling you know Absolutely. so yeah there is some margin they make more margin than uh, um a, you know a htc or or a oppo or a vivo or something like that uh, but mm-hmm. but also they they they, they pick you know top rate components and uh, the yeah. assembly and and the testing and so on is first class mm-hmm. um cuz yeah if if they had a 5% defect rate um with a warranty that they offer and the cost that it that that, that it would um incur it, it would you would be in the billions of dollars every time and uh, everybody would hear about it all the financial markets would would mm. would fret about it right so right, and you've got the customer loyalty as well because people go back right. to apple even though it's expensive because they know that it's a seamless transition from one model to the next i mean obviously sure, if yeah. you're if you're upgrading that your new iPhone say is going to be better in some ways than your old one, but it's, it, you can rely on it and that's why people pay the money. So if that reliability goes out the window, then, you know, there's a lot of other options out there, aren't there? Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. People are kind of locked in, in a way, but also Mm. it's uh, to, to a certain extent. Yeah. It's, um, it's the, how to say as they say at Apple, they're working hard so that the the, the users don't have to work hard, right? Mm-hmm. So they want to keep everything very predictable, no bad surprises, and so on. And that mm-hmm. actually takes a lot of work behind uh, in the operations. And so the second thing that jumped out at me is that people say Apple doesn't own the manufacturing facilities. Yes, but they own a lot of the production equipment. Mm-hmm. So they've been, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote from the Financial Times article, the, the first one here. Uh, the, these Apple employees have played integral roles, co-designing new production processes, overseeing the minutiae of manufacturing until things were up and running and keeping close tabs on suppliers to ensure compliance. Apple has also spent billions of dollars on custom machinery to build it, its devices developing niche expertise that its rivals did not even know about, let alone compete with, right? So um, <laughs> that might be a, a bit of a, a surprise to people, right? Like what? They own production like machinery? What does that mean? And in 2012, and people know that, I, I guess it's in the financial reports, the annual reports from, from Apple, um, because it's big numbers, right? In 2012, it amounted to more than seven billion US dollars in, uh, you know, in in, in um, production equipment that was purchased by Apple, owned by Apple, operated by you know Foxconn, Pegatron, mm-hmm. whoever, but really on Apple's books. And why would Apple put down that kind of money to buy the equipment? <laughs> Is it just to get a better better deal from the from the manufacturers? I don't think it's that simple. It, it, it's really because they purchase this equipment so that um, number one, they know exactly what it is. They they um, how to say they negotiate it directly with the equipment manufacturers. They so they know exactly what it is, what it does, and so on. And they are the only ones who can use it, right? And so $7 billion, that was more valuable than all of Apple's buildings, all of the retail stores, 
you know, everything else, right? These, uh, these assets, uh, you know, more than $7 billion, that's a lot. Now, since then, it, it, the number went down a bit, but it's still, um, it, it's still in the billions of dollars. Now, they, they give a specific example. I don't know if you remember, at one point, they launched a, a MacBook Pro um, with a body um, that was cut from a single block of aluminum, right? And, and it's still mm-hmm. the case. It's, it's still the case. So it's a block of aluminum that was CNC machined in a certain way to make space for, okay, we're going to insert the keyboard like this. We're going to put the motherboard here and the, 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 the battery here and so on, right? And it, it makes it more rigid, you know, more resistant and so on. Okay, there's, there's some nice um, um, uh, some nice benefits from that. And they really wanted to do it, but it's it's CNC machines. Uh, it, it takes a lot of machining time, you know, per piece to make. And so it's something that usually we use for prototypes, right? But then we're, usually, uh, we're, let's say we have a client that comes and say, oh, I want something in aluminum like this and like this. Okay, well, for the prototypes, we can do uh, some CNC milling, but then uh, for mass production, it's, it's going to be cheaper and, and, and more scalable to just go with die casting, right? But then die casting comes with a lot of other issues. It's porous, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So hmm. Steve Jobs just say, well, whatever. You know, these prototypes, that's what we want for mass production. What would it take, right? And then they they had to purchase uh, more than 10,000 of these CNC machines. Um, okay, we're going to make mass production just like other companies do prototypes. We don't care because we want, you know, the best laptop ever, right? Um, and so according to this Financial Times article, so they say uh, Apple made a deal with Fanuc, an automation group, to purchase its entire pipeline of C- CNC machines for years to come. And then, and then it scoured the globe for more. <laughs> um, so Fanuc is a major, major uh, uh, automation and, and, and robotics um uh, uh, supplier um, to the auto industry, to the electronics industry, and so on. And, and basically, they yeah they went to Fanuc and they say, well, this line of machine, you know, make as many as you can, and and let's make a deal, and we'll purchase all of it, right? Wow. So that's the, the the extent of the involvement in the supply chain. And small and medium sized companies cannot, you know, just don't play in that um, at that level. Yeah. It, it just doesn't happen. I mean, are you going to go to a manufacturer and commit to large volumes uh, of, of equipment purchases and, you know, for uh, on a multi, multi-year deal, right? Most of the time, you, you're not even sure if your version one product is going to work well and, and if the version two product would still need the same production equipment anyway, right? So it really requires a lot of um, uh, planning, a lot of foresight also, right? Hmm. So that's one thing. Another thing that they mention is that they go into the supply chain. Of course, so they have contract manufacturers doing, uh, you know, incoming QC and assembly and testing and inspection and packing and so on, right? Um, but they they have direct relationships with the, the component manufacturers. And, and sometimes, you know, tier one, tier two, maybe even tier, two, tier three levels. And they really want, they really tell the component suppliers, okay, we want you to go in that direction. Or not just the components, but the, um, you know, uh, some modules, the, 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 the firmware and so on. Uh, mm. People should not think just of, um, just of simple hardware products, right? So, and, and again, I'm, um, I'm quoting here. They will say typically the Apple engineer, will get the company to commit to building a custom part in massive quantities, effectively taking control of the supplier's R&D roadmap. So the Apple representatives have so much power, they go there and they say, no, no, you have to make it that way. And you have to make it in the, these quantities. Otherwise, we're, we're going to have to drop you. You know, And then to a supplier, well, being a supplier of Apple is, is really a big deal. If you if you can see you're a supplier of Apple, then 
a lot of other companies want to work with you, right? And Apple makes their list of of suppliers public to a certain extent, so they can say, "Hey, look, we you know we're an Apple supplier," um, and then a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of com- other companies want to work with them. So a lot of companies do an enormous amount of work and investment for Apple just to be in that in that group. Uh, and sometimes they only make money with the other suppliers, right? Uh, so that's again a level of um, of control of involvement in 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 the you know for all of the cu- custom components that is amazing. And Apple does not really try to say, okay, let's keep it simple. Let's use standard components. Well, they have a design. They have a certain design intent that comes from the uh, the industrial designers, and they're going to stick to it as, as much as they can. And that means in a typical iPhone or MacBook or or an AirPod, there's a lot of custom parts, you know, custom design parts, uh, not standard off the shelf components that they can find out there. No, no, no. Yeah, they want it that way, you know, with that shape. Uh, that size, doing that kind of things with that kind of performance or whatever, right? So that it fits nicely into the overall design. And again, SMEs cannot really play that game, right? Um, the, the, the graveyard of new hardware products are littered with companies that had way too many custom components mm-hmm. because custom components will come with a heck of a lot of risk <laughs> because um maybe they cannot be manufactured at the right in the right quantity at the right quality at the right cost and so on and and you know with custom components often come delays and and a lot of headaches right so that that's why mm. companies try to use standard off the shelf products for anything that is not really core to the the performance and the differentiation of their product now apple takes that to a whole other level right um let me see. Then they talk a bit about well, Foxconn. So they say Foxconn offers, uh, um, you know, a lot of labor for razor-thin margins below three percent. So again, that's that's a funny one. Um, people misunderstand that often. So yes, if you do some assembly for Apple, you're not going to make a lot of margin. Right, the mm-hmm. volumes are going to be enormous, but you're not going to make a ten percent or twenty percent margin on that. That's right. However, what they're missing is two things. Uh, they're missing the fact that Foxconn also makes some of the components, and the margin typically is higher. Okay, mm-hmm. so Foxconn does make some money overall um, when they don't completely mess something up, which obviously would cost them a lot of money. Um, but they make a higher margin on, on, on the components. And the second thing is Foxconn doesn't really care about profitability. <laughs> uh, Foxconn has been borrowing enormous amounts of money in Taiwan. And they mm. have the full support of the community and the government there. Um, you know, as long as you grow and so on, you know, we, we keep making sure you have sufficient uh, working capital so you can finance all of these things and you can you can keep growing. You know, so that's that's sort of the um, the overall policy uh, at, at Foxconn and it's been for years and years. So, um, again, you know, are you Apple? Can you force your suppliers to to work uh, for for or 3% or 2% margin, right? Probably not going to happen. So, and then they talk about the other, you know, the the competitors, the direct competitors of Apple. Uh, They had a lot of pressure. They had to basically, so there's someone here, there's a former Nokia executive who said, well, they, they abdicated, right? They just went to Chinese manufacturers Taught them everything so they could they could do it all, but um, left all the control in the hands of the Chinese manufacturers. Right, so mm-hmm. 
it's not just the Nokia, but I guess the the, the Motorola and and, and um, maybe Sony Ericsson and, and and the others over the years they have brought a lot of technical know-how to the to to Chinese manufacturers. Well, Apple has done it also, but in their own way, right? While retaining a lot of control, while saying this is our production process, this is our stuff, you can't make it for anybody else, um, and and you have to to lock this capacity in for us and we're going to make you very busy and so on, right? Um, but of course, over the years, these companies, they learn, you know, and they they can do something relatively similar with other companies as long as, there's, you know, as long as there's good industrial design and good a good sense of where the market is, is going and what the market needs, which obviously uh, is, is usually lacking in manufacturing companies. And, so, and the res- the result of that yeah. is that some of the largest phone manufacturers now are actually the Chinese brands, even if listeners listening oh, yeah. are not not actually aware of some of them. But in some cases, their sales maybe I think they're even larger than Apple because Apple aren't the biggest selling mm-hmm. mo- right. mobile phone manufacturer. Uh, but you you see you see all of the Chinese phones, and I mean in in my experience in China, they're very. Uh, if you've got money, you'll probably have an iPhone. Anyone else will have a Chinese phone, pretty much. Uh, and they're almost like ubiquitous everywhere. And they really compete with all of the Android phones, you know, the Samsung Galaxies and, you know, whatever Motorola's bringing out. And then you've got all of these Oppos and Huawei phones oh, and yes. all of these other brands. And they're huge. Uh, uh, but the difference for me is that they do not look exactly like iPhones and behave like iPhones. So I think when you spoke, speak about Apple locking it in, um, you're absolutely dead right on that. Yeah. So Huawei is, <laughs> is an enormous force, right? They're, they're fighting against Samsung for the, the num- number one spot. Um in the number of um, smartphone handsets sold mm. in the world, right? I, that might date from last year. I don't know. I don't know exactly. 2022, I don't have the numbers, but they, they, they are up there. They are selling huge numbers of smartphones. And then you have Oppo and Vivo, which I understand mm-hmm. are kind of the same group, um, but selling different products. And then you have, um, you have Xiaomi, um, and, and, and you have a number of others. The mm-hmm. Chinese over the years, they have learned, of course. And, um, it's, it's a yearly, you know, release, design, develop, manufacture, release kind of cycle. So, you know, they've been doing that for 10 cycles, 20 cycles. They have learned a lot and they've, they, they have developed their own brand and so on. And also, it's not just the, the smartphone brands, but it's all the, the network of components. Mm. Um, you can find everything that you need there in, um, in Shenzhen, Dongguan, Huizhou, in that area, right? So it's, it, it's not that difficult for them to, you know, to have very fast development cycles and to make some, some very good phones, um, yeah. with very good components that are just what they need because the, the the network of suppliers there is just amazing. It's amazing. You you know you go to to some of these um, these 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 workshops and they have a bunch of machines running 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 making very large series of of uh, of parts and they're like oh you know this goes into smartphones or you know this is for Huawei or this is for for, for Xiaomi or whatever mm. um, and some of these these shops are are pretty good. They're pretty good. Well, they They've accumulated experience over the years. And, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, their parts were going to, to, an, into an American branded phone. And, and now it's going into a, uh, a Chinese branded phone, you know, or, or it was maybe going into a Samsung phone. And now in addition to Samsung, they also make it for Huawei or something like that. Right. Sure. Because sure. Samsung had large, uh, assembly operations mostly assembly in Huizhou and they closed it uh, yeah. in 2018 or 2019, I forget. And they, they, they moved a lot of that to, to Vietnam, uh, Vietnam. So they're still buying a lot of parts from China, but um, yeah, they, they were huge also. For, um, Samsung 
there's there's a huge buyer of, of smartphone parts mm. in uh, in South China. So a lot of these companies have been training a lot of local local manufacturers, and now they're just so good, you know. So anyway, to to come back to Apple, just to 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 close this topic. Yeah. Um, the so the article kind of focuses on the how to say the attempts of Apple to get out of China, um, and um, so they, they're moving some of the the product lines to Vietnam. When it comes to the iPhone, which is mm. really the the big bulk of of the sales and profit of of the company, they are betting on uh, on India, and one of the the reasons is Apple is so big, you know, and and their sales are relatively seasonal because it's you know there's an anticipation and there's a yearly release and there's Christmas, um, so it's relatively seasonal. So they cannot have say a hundred thousand work, hundred thousand people working all year long. Uh, not only is it seasonal, but also the type of work changes because the models change. Uh, so yeah. um they found it relatively easy in china to to build this 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 massive supply chain that is very very responsive right mm. um and that's really one of the the big big strengths of china for companies that need to make relatively complex products at a scale okay and if they look at vietnam uh, Vietnam, as I usually say, is just about the size of a province in China. Um, you're not going to be able to to pull fifty thousand new people uh, very quickly who are already trained to do this kind of assembly in a couple of weeks, yeah. like they can do in, uh, in in China. It just doesn't happen. Now in India, they have the same problem. They also cannot ramp very fast, um, but they they are betting that over the years. And we, by the way, are betting the same thing for in, in building our India operations. Yeah. Is that they, they think over the years, more and more of the component suppliers will relocate there, will have some operations there, um, and they will grow the assembly operations. There will be a, a massive workforce um, that is ready to, to to take on, you know, the new models and to be maybe moved to uh, from one facility to the other mm. facility and so on. With, with some flexibility, but um, one of the, the conclusions from a lot of these um, so-called supply chain experts that they interviewed is that Apple is kind of stuck with China, um, and it's going to be impossible to find the same level of responsiveness, flexibility, but also capability, uh, you know, in a deep network of, of experienced suppliers mm. as they have in, uh, in in China. Someone who says that this kind of manufacturing is still going to be in China for the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, so the, the big question is, can Apple, by signaling that they're moving a lot of things to, to India, and by pressuring, and that's when, one thing that the, the journalists are really missing, that Apple is pressuring the component suppliers, of course, to... Um, um, to, to to set up some new operations in India or do something so that they can keep supplying Apple in, in India. And that's going to move, um, it's going to, to, to change the situation, I think. Now, this whole supply chain setup for Apple took 20 years, okay? First, they came to Taiwan and then they went into China and they, they, uh, they went step by step and they developed it you know, they, they, they scaled it up very fast as their sales scaled up. Now, yeah. Apple is more of a mature company. Uh, the, the the hardware sales are not really going up like they were going, like, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Um, so they, I'm sure they have a plan. It's just that they're kind of a secretive company and then these journalists, you know, they, they talk to people, they try to find uh, something interesting to tell their readers, but uh, um, <laughs> you, you read the article and you still don't really know what what Tim Cook's plans are, right? right. We, we're not in their boardroom. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't really know 
uh, the way they see things in the next five or 10 years, but don't worry, they have a plan. Okay, and leaving China entirely, as we discussed before the, the, the episode, leaving China entirely is probably not in their plan. Now, they might have a contingency plan for you know the case where things really, really go south between the US and China. But you know, does it involve leaving the country entirely, including leaving leaving China, you know, completely out of the supply chain? That that is near impossible. There's yeah. always going to be some specialty parts that are going to be made in China and then shipped to, if necessary, to another country for assembly or some further manufacturing before assembly. That's not going to change. That's the one thing the article mentioned um, uh, right, rightfully. Right. The, but the, the language the language used mm-hmm. for me because they talk about it's it's a disaster that that Apple is so reliant on China. <laughs> I, I wonder if Tim Cook sees it that way. I, I think with the the concerns about the the US's relationship with China, I think some of those concerns are warranted. I think some of the political plays that we're seeing from both countries mm-hmm. don't lead to a great atmosphere for manufacturers mm-hmm. in china from from the states which apple is mm-hmm. but on the other hand china itself is responsible for a fifth of apple's revenue and i don't i don't even know how many billions mm-hmm. or trillions that, that represents but that's a lot of money in dollars mm-hmm. so i think there's to say it's a disaster that apple are quite um connected with china maybe that's a bit bit a uh, bit of an over exaggeration right right so Apple's sales, according to the article last year, in China were $74 billion. Right. That's a lot of money. Now you, if for some reason you, uh, this goes down close to zero, just like it mm. did for Samsung. Now, I was mm. really amazed at the time that Samsung sales went down so fast. Um, they, yeah. I remember maybe around 2014, 15, in the Huachang Bay market in, in Shenzhen, you were walking. I mean, not really in the market, but in the Huachang Bay street, you would have a lot of distribution for Samsung. And then yeah. somewhere around 2018 or 2019, I needed to buy something and I, oh, okay, I'm close to Huachang Bay. I'm just going to walk there. And I was like, Where's the Samsung thing? You know, uh, sensing, sensing. You know, where, where is it? Um, and it, it had completely uh, disappeared. Uh, you could still buy some online, but the, most of the mm. distribution channels had been completely dismantled. And I, I, oh, I, I believe that's I because they just got crushed by by Huawei and yep. and, and the other Chinese makers, and um, and they don't have the differentiation that Apple has. You know, it's yep. still an Android. Android device and so on, and maybe not as not as good a fit for the Chinese market as uh, what the Chinese manufacturers were selling. Right, that, that, that's my my understanding. And then logical decision, you know, okay, let's. We are a Korean company. There's also some um, political uh, risks here. We'll just yeah. handle our Chinese manufacturing through contract manufacturers, and our our own manufacturing facility in China. We're just going to move it to Vietnam. You know, mm. um, that kind of makes sense for a company of that of that size and with with those resources. Uh, but is Apple going to go down that that route? I'm sure Tim Cook is working very hard to keep the relationships very good, to keep you know China Mobile to keep distributing the iPhones and all these kinds of things. And um, they, they they made a deal with with the Chinese government saying that they would keep investing in China to um, how to say to do some research to do to, yeah. to do a lot of things to keep furthering China's uh, capabilities in that industry, and I don't think they're going to stop doing that, except if mm. they have enormous pressure from the U.S. But I think that is the 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 big strategic um, you know crossroad or the the big uncertainty for for Apple's mm. top management. You know how do we keep these two masters happy because if if for some reason the Chinese government is you know becomes quite unhappy with Apple, that's going to be bad uh, at a number oh, of sure. levels. While if the U.S. government gets unhappy with Apple, well, what are they going to do? You know, uh, they're not going to shut Apple down or anything, right? So <laughs> again, mm. um, that's way way above my head, and I don't really understand everything that's involved here. But it is, of course. 
a pretty difficult uh, situation. Um, but sure. when it comes to to setting up supply chains, uh, handling the new product introduction process, and so on and so forth, mm. this 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 couple of articles were quite uh, interesting in that they mm. they gave some details of the depth into up into which Apple has been going for now you know 15 or 20 years in really setting up their own supply chain that they control that they um how to say into which they have all the visibility that they need i believe mm-hmm. um and um yeah and they've kept they've kept going deeper and deeper i mean they've been designing their own chips uh, they've they've been doing a lot of things uh, that are quite amazing frankly right um and that again, SME buyers cannot really replicate. So uh, that that's really one of the conclusions. You know, some stop comparing yourself to Apple. What works for Apple might not work for you, or might not be feasible for you. And what works for you maybe uh, doesn't work at Apple's scale, right? Mm. It, it's really a very very different beast. Oh, for sure. I think one of the learnings that we can take, though, is that diversification is is prudent at the moment. And I mean, this is something that we've spoken on the podcast before and written about. And there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, and Apple are diversifying. It's high profile that they're in Vietnam and India. And it doesn't mean that you have to cut ties with China. A lot of, you know, a lot of... Um, pundits and and commentators online are ah, china you've got to burn those bridges it's terrible but there's a difference between cutting ties and diversifying and and i think that definitely the move to india that's a very interesting one and we're going to see a lot more of that and uh even with our with our own clients as well as as well as the apples of this world so yeah that's uh mm-hmm. it's, a, it's also a good one to look at yeah correct i, I think um the article makes it look like Apple should have done that 10 years ago. Mm. But but they also at the same time say that Apple's been working on diversifying their, their sources away from China since 2014. So yeah, it takes time, but oh, yeah. Apple has their own problems. They are so huge, they cannot go into a small country. It's just, you know, these are not really lessons that SMEs should, should take home. Okay. Right. SMEs... Uh, to a certain extent, obviously don't have the same resources as Apple, but also don't have the same constraints, right? Mm. So um, uh, I think Apple is, is, yeah, uh, I'm not too pessimistic ab- about them. I think they um, they are quite aware of what's going on and yeah. they're working on the, you know, going in the right direction. Now, would they, would they like to go faster? I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But at the same time, they're quite prudent. Uh, mm. they, they're not going to go with, pretty ruthless moves is not going to happen, right? And um, the supply chain in India and in Vietnam will be quite different five years from now for, for them, right? They would not oh, be buying so many components from China. Now, they might be buying components from Chinese-owned manufacturers there, uh, you know, located with operations located in, uh, say, in, in, in Chennai or Bangalore or, or in, mm. uh, in Hanoi. Yeah, right. Um, and some of the the components will still come from China, yeah. But even if they move back to the USA, it would still have to be the case, unfortunately. That that's yep. just a crazy situation, right? And um political commentators sometimes don't really understand that. It takes time, it's a transition. And you 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 can jump from all in, in China to, to something else. And by the way, Apple is not all in, in China. It's very easy to find uh, the breakdown of some of the, the the iPhone models, and you can see, you know, maybe the, the display comes from Korea, and the battery yeah. comes from Malaysia, and 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 the processors come come from Taiwan, and so on. So they are mm-hmm. not all in 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 China. Um, people kind of miss that, and some of the mm-hmm. parts come from the USA. <laughs> they buy a lot. They buy billions of dollars from USA, um, you know, manufactured parts also. So. It's a very complicated situation and people should not try to to read too much into that and apply it to their own company, really. I think that's that's the big conclusion today. Right. Well, there you go. Uh, but uh, two very entertaining articles and it's definitely a, a good one to read. So look out for the links in the show notes if you can read those. 
Renaud, thanks. Uh, a really yeah. interesting discussion today. Right. Thanks, Adrian. And um, yeah, thanks to to the listeners. Mm. And well, you will hear from us next week as usual. Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophies Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com, that's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com, to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share, because it will really help others discover us too.